Welcome back to Pat R. LSAT Prep. In this video, we begin our presentation of Section 2 of Prep Test 76. This is the first of two logical reasoning sections, which will combine for about half your total score. There are several types of questions. Some may involve flaws in reasoning, assumptions, paradoxes, or applications of a principle. They may require that you find the best possible answer or the only possible answer. They may require that you find the closest parallel to the presentation, find the conclusion that strengthens it or weakens it, or that proves that the conclusion logically follows the presentation. In the latter case, only one of the possible responses will guarantee this. If it does not, it's wrong. The first problem presents developmental abnormalities in a group of alligators and reaches a conclusion as to why they have occurred. You are instructed to find the grounds under which the reasoning is most susceptible to criticism. It cannot be A, since the passage does not discuss abnormalities that do not suggest pollution by industrial byproducts, there would be no purpose for an explanation. It's not C, because the presentation doesn't discuss whether the byproducts are in the alligator's food or in other pollutants in the swamp water. This is irrelevant. Whether reptiles other than the alligators were affected also is irrelevant. If the presence of byproducts were proven to be the cause in the alligators, then they'd have to be present. D is incorrect. Not only is E irrelevant, but it makes no sense. We're presented with evidence and a conclusion specific to these alligators, not whether they are somehow representative. To be vulnerable to criticism, the response would need to find the flaw. That, because byproducts can cause the observed abnormalities, therefore they must. There is no suggestion that this is the only cause. B is the correct response. Question 2 presents a statement from a government official and directs you to find the logical completion of that statement. Be careful to not debate any politics with yourself. The correct response is that official's conclusion regardless of whether the reader finds it valid. Assuming that, the answer should make itself apparent. If the duties of a cabinet undersecretary should be performed only by citizens of that country, and no one should be appointed to a position presenting duties that person should not perform, then only a citizen of that country should be appointed to that position, thus disqualifying any foreign citizen. B is correct. Question 3 presents two people making an argument and posits, over what do they disagree? For this one, think about the crux of each argument. Doris believes students should get involved in student government if, as she puts it, we want them to be more outspoken. Zach believes being outspoken is precisely why those in student government are already there. This is the point of contention, and C is correct. Question 4 presents a biologist citing a study of the behavior of certain chameleons, touts the credentials of the study's author, and uses those credentials to suggest the report's critics are wrong. You are tasked with finding the flaw in the biologist's reasoning. Did you summarize the question the same way we just did? Then you already have the answer. Just for fun, though, let's go through them anyway. The biologist doesn't say that critics of the report find it too general with respect to lizards as a whole. Rather, specifically, lizards such as chameleons. A is incorrect. The biologist says critics doubt the results of the report, but not specifically why. The question wants you to find the flaw in the biologist's argument, not the study and how chameleons regulate vitamin D production is irrelevant. Since anyone can suggest a flaw with a study, it's the evidence in support, not your credentials, that will ultimately bear out. The critic's expertise, or lack thereof, is irrelevant. E is just wrong. By suggesting that it's good enough that the study's author is well regarded, the biologist doesn't hold the author to a higher standard, quite the opposite. Now, remember our summary? Question 4 presents a biologist citing a study of the behavior of certain chameleons, 
touts the credentials of the study's author and uses those credentials to suggest the report's critics are wrong. That is the vulnerability and the correct response. Question 5 presents a political scientist's argument that a protest rally featuring a message that the government supports does not prove that the government supports freedom of popular expression, which may include a message that the government does not support. You are then expected to find the one assumption that would be required by that argument. This problem in particular tests your ability to think like a lawyer. What evidence has been presented and what evidence has not? What happens to an argument when you assume something to be true? Does the argument hold? What happens when you assume something to be false? Does it collapse? It must in order to be a requirement. For example, answer A presents as a requirement that the government helped organize the rally. If true, it would suggest only that the government liked the rally and its message. That doesn't speak to freedom of popular expression in general and as such neither supports nor negates the argument. If false, it means only that the government did not have any direct effect on the rally. This does not negate the argument either. It cannot therefore be a requirement. Answer B presents as a requirement that the rally's message did not concern any function of the government. Let's assume that's false and the rally did concern some function of government. That's a long list, municipal, state, federal, writing laws, enforcing laws, executive functions. You can be in government and disapprove of something that your government does, often quite vociferously. That cannot collapse the argument and cannot be correct. D presents as a requirement that some groups might not stage a rally out of fear of government reprisal. Let's assume that's false, that there are no groups that fear government reprisal. Just because you're not afraid of something doesn't mean it can't happen. Again, the argument holds without the assumption present. E presents as a requirement that the government fears a backlash if it doesn't accept that rally. Again, assuming that's false, that the government does not fear a backlash, has no bearing whatsoever on whether it supports freedom of popular expression. It cannot be a requirement. So why is C correct? Assume the opposite that the government would have accepted a protest rally with a message it opposed. That would tend to prove support for freedom of personal expression and destroy the political scientist's conclusion. This is the required assumption. Question 6 presents a lawyer's argument that the so-called victim surcharge should not apply to perpetrators of nonviolent crimes if its purpose is to fund services specific to victims of violent crimes. You are to find the principle that would most help justify that lawyer's argument. We can eliminate A immediately for a couple of reasons. First, the penalties for a crime principle would apply to any crime, not just the violent ones. Second, this would contradict the lawyer's argument that some criminals shouldn't pay this surcharge. B makes no sense, since that principle is already in place. The perpetrator of a violent crime already gets a higher overall penalty, absent any circumstances not included within the lawyer's argument. A $30 surcharge is nothing compared to, say, many more years in custody. C is incorrect because the lawyer's argument is specific to who pays the surcharge, not to whom the funds go. Were the lawyer arguing instead that the surcharge should help fund all crime victims, this answer might be correct, but that is not the argument. E, too, cannot be correct, because the principle of fines of any amount to convicted thieves directly contradicts the lawyer's argument that the surcharge should be levied only against violent criminals. D is the correct answer, because the principle of who is required to pay for what and at what level of seriousness directly supports the lawyer's argument. Question 7 presents an economist summarizing that, since our country's economy is increasingly service-based, international trade continues to decrease. You then need to find which answer, if true, most helps support that decrease. The correct answer should jump out at you, but the others may give you pause anyway. So, let's eliminate a couple of them immediately. 
trade agreements covering both goods and services, and specialized skills among people working in both would support exactly the opposite of a widening gap. A and B are wrong. E makes no sense. The economist postulates that a more service-based economy leads to a decrease in trade, but if some services from another country can be had cheaper, this would argue for an increase in trade. What about D? Sure, it would explain the decrease in manufacturing jobs, but it doesn't say anything as to how a more service-based economy hurts trade. It doesn't contradict the economist, but it doesn't help explain the conclusion, which is what the problem requires. C, on the other hand, directly supports that conclusion. If services are mostly delivered in person, meaning locally, most of those markets would be local, cutting into trade. C is correct. Question 8 presents Merton arguing that the higher rate of heart disease in a study of people living on busy streets must therefore be caused by automobile exhaust, and Ortiz arguing, do we know for sure that it is not something else? This one, fortunately, is straightforward. If we rephrase Ortiz's question, do we know about other lifestyle factors, means the same thing as, did we rule out any other lifestyle factors? On top of that, none of the other answers makes sense. Ortiz doesn't question the study, or any of its aspects for that matter, or bring up any other effect of air pollution, or offer an alternative explanation. E is the correct response. Question 9 presents an essay on the decline of fish populations in two lakes, named Quapaw and Highwater, and the rebound of that population in Quapaw Lake, and concludes that the fishing ban at Quapaw, with no such ban at high water, must be the reason. You are tasked with finding the answer which, if it were true, most seriously weakens the argument. As it turns out, four of the responses don't affect the conclusion at all, and one all but crushes it. If there was practically no fishing at Quapaw before the ban, this argues against fishing being the cause of the decline in the first place, never mind the resurgence. B is correct. In our next video, we will present questions 10 through 18 of section 2 of PrepTest 76.